in West Zone Branch, Mumbai. Areas of interest neuroscience, genetics, dual publication to his name. He is a renowned biological psychiatrist of the country. Welcome, Dr. Mohan. Now onwards, the meeting is yours. Please carry your words. Shaman, please introduce Dr. Sajjot Singh, our speaker. And the other and uh, chairpersons can also introduce the topic. Over to you. Uh, good okay. evening, everyone. Yeah, Bhaskar, my go. topic, my yes, just I would just say that I am still in my clinic, so I would be uh, staying in the meeting but si silent. I would try to wrap it up, and meanwhile, Dr. Dave can continue the uh, session moderation till my uh, uh, clinic is done, but I would be online. And I will be ready for the question and answer session. So, good evening, everyone. And uh, on uh, behalf of myself and uh, uh, Dr. Bhaskar, uh, we would uh, like to thank uh, the trio for inviting us as chairpersons for this session on uh, Thursday musings. Uh, uh, and uh, to introduce Dr. Jagjot, who is uh, the speaker for the day, he did his graduation from GMC Patiala and MD Psychiatry from DMC Hospital Ludhiana. He's a member of IPS, IABP, and APA. He's currently running the Department of Mental Health and Behavior Sciences at Fortis Hospital Ludhiana. His areas of interest include adult, perinatal, and liaison psychiatry. Um, about the topic that he's going to tell us about, talk to us about, uh, a, a very important uh, development in the understanding of uh, uh, psychiatry, so to say, with the understanding that we have got from uh, this disorder per se. But uh, let me not spill the beans and uh, hand over the mic to Dr. Jagjot Singh, all yours. Uh, if there are any questions, please uh, put them in the chat box and please uh, write your name. So we would like to know who's asking the question. There are a lot of these Samsungs and things like that. I don't know whether they're persons or they're chat GPT clones here, but yeah, we would like to have a good conversation after Dr. Jagjot Singh has spoken. Over to you, Jagjot. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Let me share my screen with you guys. So let me know when the screen is visible because I'm logging through. Okay, screen. Okay, is it visible, Abhi? No, I can't see. No. I can't see. Okay. No. अगर ज्यादा दिक्कत हो तो भेज सकते हैं किसी को भी अलीम को भी किसी को तो वो शेयर कर लेंगे वहां से हां हो गया स्क्रीन शेयर हो गया होगा मैं शेयर हो माय प्रेजेंटेशन और टॉप इज न्यू शेयर यस गो जी या राइट सो आई एम ऑडिबल एंड यू कैन सी द स्क्रीन राइट यस सो राइट So let's begin. Today's topic is autoimmune encephalitis. My name is Dr. Jagjot. What's in it for me? So the point of this caption is as a psychiatrist, what are things I or we should know about this disorder? <coughs> what is its current understanding? And how does it shape the treatment of psychiatric disorders in the coming future? So as the name suggests, autoimmune diseases are where your immune system attacks the healthy cells in your body by mistake. And in this case, it's the brain. <clears throat> well, the most common type of autoimmune encephalitis is anti-N-methyl-D-aspartate receptor encephalitis or anti-NMDAR encephalitis. As you all know, this is a glutamate receptor. The identification of anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis about 12 years ago, made it possible to recognize that some patients with the rapidly progressive psychiatric symptoms or cognitive impairment or seizures, abnormal movements or coma of unknown cause had an autoimmune disease. Now, prior to this, 
anything happening within the brain which had some pathology and it was considered organic was taken towards infective pathology with the new research they found out it is not only the viruses that can enter the brain it's body's own immune system that can attack once something else has been there now what else can be there we'll discuss well there was uh, this topic gained a lot of popularity worldwide when this book was published and it was new york times best seller later a movie was also made on the same and it's still on netflix anybody interested it gives a vivid description of the symptomatology they've done some justice to the disease with a little bit of drama which is necessary now before starting with what we are going to through i'll take you through two basic stories my perspective or my aim of this presentation is going to be <coughs> to outreach everyone with a clinical purview of what happens in autoimmune encephalitis we all go through and can go through the literature and uh, the psychopathology and the depth but what we lack when such cases come is our clinical assessment clinical judgment so if i do not know anything about this disease and i have to do my opd the next day so what are the things i should keep in my mind what are the things that i should be looking for when a patient comes and i think it's a case of psychosis or let's say a schizophrenic and it turns out otherwise so story the first story a 16 year old female was admitted in the psych ward with a complaint of disorganized behavior increased the demands occasional self talking making gestures in the air from the past few weeks she would have bouts of irritability in which she would become physically violent and would later apologize for it she would sometimes have episodes of unresponsiveness lasting for a few seconds while given the history she would often say that she wants to be miss universe and that her parents are pressurizing her to go for the studies but the poor pgt taking the case made a differential of conversion oblique dissociative disorder and she was put on ssri along with benzodiazepines her symptoms worsened over days she was given haloperidone for her irritable outbursts which led to acute dystonia she also developed abnormal hand movements like grasping and clawing and leg shaking that had no correlation with the eeg pattern done alongside her mri brain was normal and the same treatment was continued later her speech became a little nonsensical in one night she had these recurrent episodes of screaming and abnormal body movements i'm telling this story from a perspective of a first to the second year pgt for which she was given injection haloperidol injection lorazepam but the episodes continued the whole night and the next morning she was shifted to the icu in the icu her bedside eeg showed continuous epileptiform discharges the whole neurology team came this saw she went into bradycardia and then later on she started experiencing tachycardia her blood pressure was fluctuating up and down the respiratory rate was going low three different anti epileptic drugs couldn't control her seizures she had to be intubated her csf showed occasional lymphocytes but her autoimmune panel was negative the second mri showed limbic encephalitis but by then it was too late the 16 year old girl had expired <coughs> now let me take you to the second story this is a case we saw uh, recently during our practice this was an 18 year old female and she was admitted in the hospital with the complaint of acute onset behavioral changes including marked fearfulness decreased interaction with the family members at normal movements of the upper limb and orofacial movements she had not slept for 6 days she was having auditory hallucinations and would become markedly irritable with the nursing staff due to which she had to be restrained it looked like psychosis but not psychosis the neurologist and the nursing staff for a while thought that she is a hysterical female with some functional symptoms low dose lanzapine was given to her at night with which her aggression improved but the next day she showed marked rigidity posturing with waxy flexibility her symptoms responded to lorazepam challenge test but the very next day she developed orofacial dystonia and became ophisthotonus with her back hyperextended on detailed physical examination she was found to have injury marks on both her knees elbows 
an abrasion on her forehead. Now, while inquiring the whole history from the father, he recalled that while trying to run out of the house, she suddenly fall, fell forward, about which the patient had no recollection, showing a possibility of a seizure, although her MRI brain and EVG was normal till then. Thinking on the lines of NT and MDAR encephalitis, her CSF was sent for autoimmune panel, which came out to be positive for NT and MDAR antibodies. She was started on IV steroids with alone, to which she responded, and her life was saved. She did require antidepressant, I must add, after her discharge, which she continued for a year, following which she joined her college and is doing well. Now, after going through these two cases, in which the first case was about knowing something which we were almost never taught, and then going through the whole literature, and then seeing the symptoms in front of us and actually having that filter to visualize that, okay, this can be something other than psychosis. Now, how does the evolution of encephalitis come into picture? Encephalitis is simply the inflammation of brain and is often thought to be mediated by infections. For example, viral infections, we must have heard about having HSV viral infection, RP simplex leading to encephalitis. With the advances in molecular diagnostic, new immunological markers such as antibodies are discovered in patients presenting with encephalitic syndromes. Thus, research has evoked interest in the immune theory of encephalitis. And not just encephalitis, with this theory, we are unmasking a lot of other psychopathologies as well. In 1960, Berele and colleagues described three cases of subacute encephalitis of later adult life mainly affecting the limbic areas and presenting with psychiatric symptoms, mainly affective symptoms. Later, the syndrome was recognized as occurring in association with a carcinoma, most commonly a teratoma. Hence, when a young female presented with symptoms of encephalitis, she was also looked for having a tumor in her ovaries, for example, a teratoma. Now, the attack against the teratoma or the tumor also crossed the blood-brain barrier and the antibodies attack started attacking the brain tissue. While the attack started, the killer T cells also invaded the place and sometimes the autoimmune process takes over and it damages us. Then the initial description of Hashimoto's encephalopathy, now also known as steroid responsive encephalopathy associated with autoimmune thyroiditis came into the picture, which suggested that not all encephalopathies were cancer related. Now, after this, we had a case in, during our PG times and she had psychosis and we could not treat her. She was eventually financially poor. She had to be given discharge. When she went, her thyroid report, which was much awaited, came and we saw all she needed was methylprednisolone at that time and her. Uh, and to be very honest, such cases respond beautifully. Hence, it is steroid, it's called steroid responsive encephalopathy. Now, later on, the modern era of autoimmune encephalitis studies were inaugurated by the discovery of encephalopathy syndromes associated with antibodies targeting extra neuronal proteins, extracellular neuronal proteins. Extracellular, can it be intracellular? Yes. Can it be on the synapses? Yes. We'll talk about that. The largest prospective study published to date in a first episode psychosis population reporting with NMDAR antibodies in 3% of 228 patients of the first episode of psychosis. This we are talking about psychosis and we are getting these antibodies positive around 3%. And none in, a, and none in an age matched control group was seen by Lennox et al. in 2017. Hinting towards the glutamate hypothesis of schizophrenia. Now, <clears throat> what exactly happens in, happens in the brain when there's an attack or an immune attack? And why does a patient have such symptoms or psychiatric symptoms or mood or affective symptoms? There are three groups of antibodies against intracellular, that is inside the cell, extracellular synapse related and cell surface antigen. Now, if we closely look at that, this image, uh, if it is clear to you, in the first image, you can see that there is a red colored cell surface antigen to which the antibodies are binding. Now, when this complex forms, the killer cells come and they start attacking. In the second image to the right, 
if you look closely, there are some yellow dots inside the neuron. These are intracellular antigens. Now coming back to the first image, if you look at the right lower corner, there's a synapse. And on that synapse, there's a red antigen. And on that antigen, there's an antibody. So these are three places where the antibodies can attack. And when they attack, and depending on which part of the brain they attack, the symptoms emerge. Hence, no longer a delusion is a delusion or a plain hallucination is a hallucination. This becomes a part of a bigger picture. Not just like the saying, uh, many Ji. viewers are complaining that the slide is not uh, moving. Visible. So slide There's is not quite moving. And that quite many comment in chat box that is very interfered. Uh, can you see? Okay. Actually, it the is moving. Slide. But it is visible to me. All movement. I, I yeah, see the slide. Yeah. Television. Yes, yes, it is. We are. It's. He is audible. We are able to see the slides moving. So doesn't yeah. seem to be. But many problem. are many are complaining. Can we re? You know, Jagdhat, can you see in the chat box? A lot of people are telling it's not visible. Uh, it's not moving. Is it visible now? I've, I've I, think was, yeah, I think I think Jagjot, you run the just in the next few minutes. Just uh, start from slide one till you have reached. Let's see if people are able to see the change because it's it's quite okay. Not a problem. Yeah. So okay, this is the first slide, and the second case is yeah. another case. Let's be good on evaluation. This is the slide we are currently on. Yeah, so uh, is is it visible now to everybody, those who put up that uh, issue? Just please write in the chat box so that we can move ahead. Hopefully yeah, think, so. Yeah, I Hopefully think so. so yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah, you can go ahead. Doctor. No problem. Right. So after looking at this diagram, or you can imagine if you're not able to look at the slide, I'll just ask you to imagine a neuron. You can imagine the cell bodies, the soma, and then the dendrites. The antibodies can attack the surface, they can attack the synapse, and they can even enter inside the neuron and make an intracellular changes. Now, what these antibodies do, they bind and then disrupt the synaptic interaction. So the neurons are not able to interact. Now, they enter the limbic system and they're not allowing the limbic system to work. Now, this patient will have symptoms which were earlier the normal functions of that system. Now the plasticity of these epitopsin prevents the active expression of these receptions, uh, receptors in a very simplistic manner. <clears throat> now, coming to the complex part, I'll just touch the complex part uh, so that we should have an idea of what are the different kinds. Uh, we are already aware of anti-NMDR encephalitis, which is the most common autoimmune encephalitis in which IgG antibodies are against the GNU N1 subunit of the NMD receptor. Now, it can affect all age groups. It is more common in children and young adult females. So if you have a patient who is young, with you know, the gender being female, atypical response to your antipsychotics has such psychiatric symptoms, <clears throat> you can think of NMD encephalitis. Second is VGKC, complex antibody-mediated encephalitis. In short, we'll call it VGKC. Now, VGKC includes limbic encephalitis. The patient will have epilepsy and there will also be peripheral nerve hyperexcitability. In this, what we have to remember with VGKC is limbic encephalitis is the most common syndrome form. The girl we had that expired actually had VGKC, the limbic component. Now, the anti-LGI1 encephalitis. In this, all you have to remember is if you're thinking of autoimmune encephalitis in an elderly male patient, and let's say the patient is having temporal lobe seizures or TLE and there's agitation and the elderly male is in the ICU and delirium and he's not getting better than anything. Think of NTLG1. Now, NT-CASPER2, in this patient, you have to remember that the patient will have encephalopathy with marked insomnia. The history will be that his vitals are going haywire, there's this autonomia, and the patient is not sleeping from the last so many and so many days. Yes, there will be subacute onset of peripheral nerve hyperexcitability. So insomnia with dysautonomia is Casper. When we come to the next anti GABA receptor, now if the antibodies attack the GABA receptors, now this will be associated with a lung carcinoma. So you'll have a patient, and this affects equally men and women. We won't be looking at men smoking. 
No. Small cell carcinoma patient develops encephalitis, features of limbic encephalitis and seizure. Now this goes more towards anti-GABA receptor encephalitis. The last one being anti-AMPA receptor encephalitis. Now this predominantly affects middle-aged women, around 60 or for female, presenting with a subacute onset with limbic encephalitis and prominent psychiatric symptoms. So she had no history of psychosis whatsoever, no family history, no past history. At, at 60 years, she developed psychosis. Your medications are not helping. You can think of anti-AMPA receptor encephalitis. Now, why should we study? I think most of the points are clear by now. Three things that the literature has mentioned and why should autoimmune encephalitis should be an important thing for a psychiatrist. Firstly, they commonly present with psychiatric symptoms, although usually alongside neurological features. Secondarily, they can also present with isolated psychiatric symptoms. They can have an episode, encephalitis, and which passed on, and then nobody could find out. The patient got a little better, then it can come again. Now, such patients, uh, I'll give you the red flags. Why, when should a psychiatrist think that it is not psychosis and something else? Now, thirdly, the antigenic target in this encephalitis is frequently a neurotransmitter receptor or an associated protein, which are often implicated in the etiologies of primary psychiatric disorders. For example, if you look at glutamate receptor or anti-NMDA encephalitis. <coughs> now, looking at the incidence, it is not a common disease. It is rare. It is estimated with an incidence of 1.5 per million population per year, but it was described only 12 years ago. So you might be seeing all these patients. You might be diagnosing them and treating them, sometimes without knowing that it was actually encephalitis. Now, the impact of this disorder in neuropsychiatry has been remarkable. At onset, about 90% of the patients have prominent psychiatric or behavioral symptoms that can be difficult to differentiate from primary psychiatric disease. Studies showing that the patient's antibodies cause a reduction in synaptic cluster of NMD receptor have suggested similarities between the synaptic mechanism of this disease and those related to NMD receptor hypofunction hypothesis of schizophrenia has been, we've been taught. Now, tumors, usually ovarian teratoma and HSV encephalitis are also known triggers of NMDA receptor autoimmunity. <laughs> Clinical features and diagnostic criteria. There is, mostly we'll be talking about, now that focus is going to be on the most common one. The common remains a common and we should also study them first. NMDA, anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis has a female predominance of a ratio of 8 is to 2. The age distribution is wide, but the median is 21 years. So you will have a young female, and it could also be a young male. So the chances of it of having a female gender, the patient being a female gender, is more. In 2013, a series of 577 patients detailed the frequency and variety of symptoms and highlighted some of the differences between children and adults at the disease onset. Seizures, abnormal movements, insomnia and irritability. These were more common in the children presenting with encephalitis. Psychosis, abnormal behavior or mood symptoms were more common in adults. Now, approximately 80% of the patients improved or recovered after immunotherapy. Uh, this is the American data. And it is a little, if I may say, over-promising. In India or in our subcontinent, it doesn't really happen that way because mostly the diagnosis is missed. And when we have a diagnosis, sometimes it becomes a little late. Now, psychiatric features. The first large US series of 100 patients in 2008 indicated the psychiatrists participated in the initial assessment of 77% of the patients. Although UK does not show a similar pattern, only 18% of the patients presented to the psychiatrist and all were managed by neurologists. It can have the difference could be because of the difference in the healthcare system protocol. In fact, more recent reports indicate that psychiatrists are increasingly involved in the diagnosis and the treatment of these patients as well, because they're the first one who encounter these symptoms. And the psychiatric symptoms are no longer the psychiatric symptoms, because the common organ is the brain.
Amrit, has it stopped or mine is not coming? No, no, it stopped. I think. Yes, no, I hand. think. Yeah, is Jagjot will have to be messaged. I think it has got stuck there. Yeah, yeah. He has anti-internet antibodies. I think. Anti Alim involved internet antibody. I think from time to time all of us have that. So, yeah. Uh, speaker is just logging back. Easy. Yeah, yeah. No okay. problem. Okay. Take a we'll, we'll we'll wait for a moment. Yeah. So till now, um, just to fill in the gap till JJ comes back. I think at all points in time, uh, since day one of our residency and over so many years of cumulative practice, you know, there are about 141 participants, including Alim and Amrit and myself and Sir and also, you know, we have got a collective of thousands and thousands of hours of clinical practice combined. And I'm sure that uh, all of us have encountered uh, such patients. Uh, they might present with... Uh, Two or three things which uh, Jagjot has said. One is uh, uh, very atypical types of onset, very sudden onset. It's it's easy to uh, uh, you know uh, uh, understand if that uh, acute onset is associated with some kind of a stressful situation or post some infection. That's easy to understand. But something that happens very rapidly, uh, without you know uh, a, a sufficient warning period or a period of development of some symptoms. That is one thing. Second thing is rapid fluctuation of symptoms. Today it is looks psychotic, tomorrow it looks dissociative and so on and so forth. And uh, there is always a pressure on us, uh, especially people who are in private practice to produce results. You know, patient is doing like this, not manageable at home. Sometimes they might even refuse to admit patients. So then it becomes a big uh, headache because, well, we need to show them results that this is manageable and this will get well and so on. And, and, and that is when this atypical kind of responses will start. Too much of sedation or too many uh, motor side effects of uh, the drugs that we use or something or the other happening, a sudden seizure. And that is probably where we are at a loss to understand uh, why some things are happening. So second one is that too many changes, too many different types of symptoms. You know, we are not able to really uh, uh, classify, you know, what is the main subset of symptoms. Now, especially... If you're looking at NMDAR, NTNA, NMDAR, uh, encephalitis, happens in uh, the common onset is in younger individuals, especially women. So even when there is a first psychotic episode, what does happen is that uh, the earlier the episode starts or the earlier the presentation starts, it's it's always a mix of symptoms. It's, it's as it is never clear cut. Even if there might not be any encephalitis. It's, it's always a mix of symptoms, OC, OCD-like symptoms, depressive symptoms here and there, mood fluctuations, psychosis. So that, that is the point when we are probably looking at something like this also. So that becomes uh, a, a, an issue. So early onsets or atypical late onset. Now somebody has got no family history or no psychiatric history, so to say, over the lifespan and suddenly things start happening later on in life when there are no typical onset of disorders, you know, uh, generally seen. Uh, I think anybody who develops a psychiatric disorder for the first time after 35 requires a, a slightly different way of looking at it, especially now that we have things like this. Uh, it's gone off completely. No, what's happened? Screen has gone. Yeah. So any anybody after 35 probably with, again, this kind of symptoms would... Uh, uh, should make us alert to the possibility that uh, something like this is going on. Women, uh, we see a lot of women patients who have got um, uh, hypothyroidism, which begins in their early 20s. And many a times uh, there is an autoimmune component to that also. So along with their T3, T4 and TSH, it's better we get their antithyroid antibodies done also because that also becomes an indicator that there might be some autoimmune uh, problems going on. Uh, Jagjot, are you there now? Yes, I'm there. Can you? Yeah, so I tried yeah. to fill in some time. Now back to you. Thank you so much for saving me. I didn't realize I was out. Okay, so 
and please put in Can your you questions on which slide did you lose me i think it was the psychiatric psychiatric symptoms that psychiatric symptoms before that the one features yeah that features, features. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this one this one ji so shall i continue Can yes please, please yeah please okay. right so the first large us series of 100 patients indicated that psychiatrists participated in the initial assessment of 77% of the patients the same pattern was not seen in uk only 18% of the patients presented to the psychiatrists and mostly were managed by neurologists now this could be a difference could be due to the healthcare protocol in fact more recent reports indicate that psychiatrists are increasingly involved in the diagnosis and treatment of these patients given the primary symptoms are psychiatric symptoms now in a retrospective study of 111 adult patients noted that 60 out, that out of 65 out of 111 patients that is roughly 60% initially presented with psychiatric symptoms which included visual or auditory hallucinations which of 40% acute schizoaffective episodes around 23% depression in around 23% mania in around 8% and addictive and eating disorders in around 6% 47% patients developed hyperthermia muscle rigidity coma rhabdomyolysis that suggested the intolerance to the neuroleptics having said that we should keep a differential of nms alongside now can you see this slide can anyone say yes 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 so this is a slide by dr joseph he is currently working in barcelona and he is one of the pioneers in the field of autoimmune encephalitis and in fact he has discovered various antibody variants now he has described it in a very simplistic form if you look at this slide there is in the first week there is a viral prodrome the young patient or the patient develops a viral infection febrile illness and once it subsides starts a deterioration in his mental status or the psychotic symptoms in the next coming 1 to 2 weeks the psychiatric symptoms could be delusions it could be hallucinations mania changes in his speech it can range from pressured speech to paucity of speech even mutism there will be disorganized thinking it can have catatonia now the catatonia can fluctuate with abrupt agitation like one day the patient could be catatonic the other day you will find out that he is agitated and one could think of having mixed delirium but it is actually the autoimmune encephalitis the patient can also have symptom of insomnia and often seizures if you remember the example of the girl we cited who had injury on her knees the elbows and the forehead it was the seizure that led us to go for the eeg again and form a diagnosis that she was having seizures even in the icu and then which later led us to go for the csf antibodies then from weeks to months develops the neurological complications if not treated they can persist with the neurological movement abnormalities dysautonomia occurs dysautonomia the autonomic tone goes haywire there is bradycardia and there is this tachycardia the patient's respiratory rate starts to fall and then seizures keep coming back again and even refractory seizures can occur now after within months to years there is recovery but there could be prolonged deficits as well executive dysfunction impulsivity disinhibition sleep abnormalities moving on to the movement disorders seizures and icu challenges the reason i put this slide is because most of the patients land up in the icu about 70% of the adults 95% of the young children develop abnormal movements now what kind of abnormal movements can be there i'll try to show you the kind of abnormal movements we have seen and i hope i do justice to them i may look funny in few then there are orofacial movements in the oral facial movements you could see the patient doing things like oo and there there could be a sound like coo then there could be facial movements and you would be like okay the patient has psychosis why is the patient flickering lingual dyskinesia the tongue could roll and the tongue could protrude out chorea well we've all seen chorea in huntington's disease is irregular random involuntary movements there is no rhythmicity in them then there is atetosis atetosis is slow serpentine movements in which the hands or the arms move like as if there is a snake moving there could be dystonia the dystonia could occur like this or the neck the patient would have recurrent dystonias 
myorhythmias there could be repetitive rhythmic movement of a muscle or a group of muscle like the patient would do this blinking his eyes moving his ocular muscles or moving his jaw muscles there could be opisthotonus now opisthotonus is backward arching i put a small video in the end if you are able to see that i'll show you how opisthotonus the girl became Bellissimus, bellissimus are violent upper limb movements, and we can easily identify. Blepharospasm spasm is eyelid twitching. The patient rapidly twitches his eyelids. Ocular gyric crisis is fixed upward eyelids. Now the eye walls are looking up, and the patient is not looking down. What is that? This is ocular gyric crisis. Now, such as these movements can occur in these patients. Approximately seventy percent of the patients develop seizures. So always remember to look for seizures. the seizures resolve after the encephalitis subsides valproate levator acetab and carbamazepine are similarly effective although carbamazepine is associated with fewer side effects about 70% of the patient admitted to the icus for airway protection dyskinesia persistent dysautonomia and a fluctuating level of consciousness or breathing dysfunction orofacial dyskinesias and opisthotonus posturing might cause dislodging and malfunction of the airway devices uh jagjo just uh, again that same, same thing seems to be happening the slides are stuck so uh, where you started two slides back okay the one before the one before yeah okay so just move yeah so is it visible to everybody now the diagram is visible yeah okay yeah move yeah. it's fine fine okay back, so yeah. movement disorders have been covered yeah move on okay. okay so we'll be moving to diagnostic clues so what are the clues that will help you have a diagnosis that the patient is not of psychosis or dissociation or some other psychiatric pathology and this is encephalitis sleep dysfunction severe insomnia is more frequent in such cases than hypersomnia excitement disinhibition manic behavior alternating with dis, uh, depressive behavior can occur agitation or aggression can be there in children temper tantrums kicking biting and hitting very common a rapid onset this is the line i want you to remember symptoms develop in days or weeks in contrast to primary psychiatric illnesses diseases usually which have a slower progression of symptoms or in case of acute psychosis onset is usually preceded by behavioral changes uh, children and young adult predominance the median age of this disease onset is 21 years so and the female predominance is there with the ratio of 8 is to 2 there could be fluctuating catatonia the catatonia fluctuates with extreme agitation so i'll be moving to the next slide i hope the next slide is visible that says negative and positive symptoms can you have a yes 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 uh, okay. uh, jagjo so, one one more thing uh, there is that uh, uh, that banner which comes at the bottom if you can just press hide so that might go off sure yeah is it gone yes Correct. yes so we all know about negative and positive symptoms now they both occur at the same time in such cases in usually in schizophrenia positive symptoms are disproportionately more frequent than the negative symptoms memory deficit memory formation is impaired and examinations are often difficult due to agitated patient having speech problems and most patient do not remember the large periods of their disease after recovery decrease of verbal output or mutism a rapid decrease of verbal output occurs particularly in children and it can be preceded by pressured speech antipsychotic intolerance this pertains to typical or atypical antipsychotic expert op uh, opinion suggest that the frequency of adverse effects is higher with the typical antipsychotic so if at all you have to use antipsychotic i prefer you use antipsychotics which are atypical especially the peens uh, not the dones or the atypical uh, or the typicals rule out nms well hyperthermia coma muscle rigidity high serum creatinine kinase concentration or rhabdomyolysis can occur in neuroleptic naive nt and ndr patients individuals considered to have a primary psychiatric disease and treated with neuroleptics can be misdiagnosed with nms missing the actual disease that is the nt nmdr encephalitis so i'll be moving to the next slide which is of the red flags is it visible yeah 
Yeah. So subacute onset. So you are looking at a pathology which is going to be rapid. You are going to lose the patient, and it will be like slipping through your hands. Subacute onset. Speech dysfunction from pressured speech to mutism. Seizures. Now we could miss the seizure. You could do an EEG and still miss a seizure, and later on the seizures won't stop, and you'll be like, why isn't anything working? Catatonia. It can alternate between. catatonia as well as agitation if you remember the case of the girl we had given lorazepam challenge test and she responded beautifully from being catatonic within seconds she made an eye contact with us and that's when we realized that okay fine we do know something about this patient and yes we can do something about it movement disorders as described earlier decreased level of consciousness to a level of coma significant cognitive impairment autonomic instability the heart rate is going up or down and you don't know why neuroleptic sensitivity you give an antipsychotic and patient is having all the possible adverse effects and you don't know why hyponatremia the patient has have low sodium and the sodium is not getting corrected with supplementation of sodium and headache these are the red flags which a psychiatrist should keep in mind when they have such patients now in order to support this what should we investigate about three things i want you to remember and i'll add the fourth which is the most important one first is an mri now if you remember the case the mri was normal yes you have to wait until the pathology comes into the picture what you'll see is in the t2 flare hyper intensity is in the medial temporal lobe so ask the radiologist to look for the medial temporal lobe and look for hyper intensities over there and you are suspecting something which is encephalitis if you do an eeg if at all there are epileptiform discharges there will be extreme delta brush i know the image is too small but on the right side of the red arrow it's showing it's showing the delta brush so i want you to remember the term medial temporal lobe hyperintensities and on eeg there should be delta brush if the patient has landed up into encephalopathy will be slow generalized delta theta variation on seeing the csf there will be lymphocytic pleocytosis there will be large lymphocytes in the csf you could have all these three tests normal and the patient could still have encephalitis then how would you know you go for the fourth test which is getting the antibodies tested for the suspected encephalitis and you take the sample from the csf not the serum now that we know that we can diagnose and now we know and how do we manage we get an mri we get an eeg we send the csf and we do the antibody testing igg antibody testing from the csf now the treatment part is mostly done by the neurology team uh, it can be done jointly as well the patient can be given methyl uh, we can give an iv dose of methyl prednisolone 1 g daily for 5 days or ivigs you have to suppress the immune system because the immune system is attacking the brain there can be plasma exchange or plasma pheresis in severe attacks or incomplete response to steroid <coughs> if there is still no response there have been many cases of patients who have responded to rituximab if there is import, um, uh, improvement we can put the patient on a maintenance treatment on oral prednisolone which will be tapered down now uh Can you see the slide in which there's a female patient? I've taken the permission from the family. Yeah, we can. So I'll okay. play the first video. Uh, although it may not be visible, I'll try to show. The first video shows the orofacial dystonia or dyskinesia. So if you look at the face, the tongue is coming out, and she's making that sound. even if you not can't see the video the image would show that her lips are pouted and, and the tongue was out and the nurse was shouting that she is doing the thing again call the supervisor she is faking it now in the second video was a video visible i mean did i was i able to play it i think you just uh, click on the play again for the first one for the first first one, one. yeah it comes but i think there's a lag So I'll continue it. Yeah. So first the lips will come, then the tongue will come, then the cool sound. Okay, I think go to the next one. Yeah, it it it's coming. So going to the next. Yeah. 
Okay, right. It is jerky on my screen as well. So this was the vestotonus posture. Slowly, slowly, the patient went into hyper extension of the spine, which was quite painful. And if you can see the inverted image, this is how our legs went. Uh, I thought of playing the video. I took the risk, although I knew that it might not be able to, I won't be able to do justice. But if the image is uh, visible, you can see how. You can, can get the idea. Yeah, yeah. You can get the idea. You can put the next. Sure. All right. Well, that was most of the presentation, uh, which brings me to the conclusion with the take home messages. A take home message from my side would be a detailed history careful consideration to the syndrome and determination of IgG antibodies in the CSF are crucial to prevent misdiagnosis. Not every delusion, hallucination is a part of schizophrenia. These symptoms can appear even in infections or autoimmune encephalopathies, depending upon which part of the brain is being targeted. Evidence continues to be found to suggest a close link of the CNS in the immune system in the neuropsychiatric disorders. As interest in autoimmune encephalitis produced by the interactions of the neuronal surface antibodies with the protein such as NMD receptor or LG1 increased over the last decade. The clinical interface between psychiatry and neurology has undergone significant advances. Thank you so much for letting me present the cases. Thank you, Jagjot. Wonderful presentation. So yes. You can stop the slides here. Yeah. Okay. Right. So <coughs> I hope I'm able to finish it in time. It's nine. It's, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Over to the persons for their opening remarks. Yes. Yeah, so um, a very nice, uh, succinct uh, clinical presentation. I think that would uh, appeal to everybody. Uh, and uh, it kind of, uh, as I was saying in the filler, that in, in all our collective hours and years of practice, we must definitely have seen uh, and managed and sometimes successfully managed these patients without knowing uh, what has what has been the underlying cause. Because uh, I believe that very milder forms of disease might be self-remitting. So, you know, we just do some symptomatic treatment from our side and the patient gets well. Uh, well, having said that, uh, on the topic, there have been some questions. In fact, most of the time, people have been complaining about their slides not being seen. But in between, there have been some questions. So let us take them. Uh, the first question is... Uh, just a second. I think there was a question related to ECT. Why, why, why should someone have this uh, disease? How does it happen? Very, very. Uh, Alim, you are not heard clearly. What did you say? Why, why should someone have this uh, problem? Okay. How does it start? Yes. How does it start? Yes, Chakjot, for you, question. Okay. Origin so, of or, origin of antibodies to <coughs> one's own brain tissue. Right. So, so we'll take two examples. First example, and let's say somebody has a, a small cell carcinoma. Let's say somebody has a lung carcinoma. Now there's a foreign tissue, there's an overgrowth. The body wants to heal it, treat it, kill it. Then we have natural killer cells. Now when the natural killer cells attack, I'll give a simplistic uh, uh, explanation of this phenomenon. When they attack, sometimes they go blind. They don't know what they're attacking. And they can even cross the blood-brain barriers. And sometimes these antigens tag certain wrong tissue, such as neuronal tissue, and whatever it is tagged, then they go and attack those neuronal tissues or the neurons inside the brain. And that's when the inflammation of the brain starts. Similarly, it is seen in young females who have teratoma or ovarian carcinoma. The basic principle which is involved in any autoimmune process is the auto uh, antibodies which are supposed to help us 
that also even happened in uh, if you really look at the covid crisis and it was not the covid virus affecting our lungs and damaging it was our own body's immune system attacking the lungs which led to the use of steroids but it was very important when to use those steroids and lower down the impact of our own immune system so sometimes our Thank immune you. system attacks us malabas malabas is also on the same lines gb syndrome is also on the same lines then yes yes so so the question here is that uh, this do we all normally have antibodies to our own cells and tissues means Not normally all. normally like you know we are let's assume we are disease free okay so is it uh, possible that we will have antibodies to our own normal tissue any tissue you take whether it's skin hair i mean hair is that skin cardiac muscles brain lungs pancreas do we have that normally normally present and auto antibodies and if I they are know. present if they are present i mean it's just a theoretical thing now since we are looking at because this auto antibody see uh, we can understand that when there is a kind of a viral infection or whatever infection is there or whatever uh, uh, let's say there is some kind of uh, damage to any tissue it sets up an inflammatory process and in mm. response or, or, or as a part of that in, uh, inflammatory process there are going to be antibodies right it is for anything <clears throat> anything that causes a damage or causes some harm to the body triggers of this thing so we understand that's a protective mechanism but for apparently healthy now when we look at your first patient that young girl uh, who who was not Uh, who you know people could not diagnose and she was not saved in time uh why would this antibodies be there in the first place well there's a acute viral phenomena happening which triggers the antibody response there, there are there are two things one is a post viral encephalitis and second is an right. autoimmune encephalitis the difference being right. in one there is a demonstrable or or some kind of viral etiology which is preceding the onset of all neuropsychiatric complications and here you may not have a viral infection of anything and that is what is very alarming is a very sudden onset right. very very sudden onset today a person is fine and tomorrow onwards he or she might start showing symptoms uh, and as you mentioned all the red flags you know very sudden uh, onset very fast evolution of things very fast changing catatonia and things like that it may not yeah. necessarily a virus can trigger an autoimmune response but it may not be necessary it might be so low grade that it might not be uh, even noticeable by anybody so so the question is why do these auto antibodies come from are they normally present in our cells so that something happens or something doesn't happen and they start uh, functioning more than what they should be doing well i wish i could answer that so so that remains a question and and probably what uh, what we need to kind of think is that see uh, our body is always in a state of use and wear and tear and repair so anything that you know is uh, has kind of lived past its utility will need to be broken down and that is also what happens with all our, all the proteins that are there in the body because protein structure of cells of uh, neurons of all the receptors of enzymes will need to be under repair because it's not that i'm born with this thing and i'm going to die with the same thing there is going to be a lot of wear and tear because these things are working all the time and this wear and tear especially the tear part now the receptor is used now we want a you know a new one because this is worn out right we change clothes that the same same thing is that we just remove the clothes and throw them away we don't recycle that we now need to recycle because we are you know bang in the middle of an end, you know climate crisis but when there is recycling whatever is there needs to be broken down first and and the best way to do this breakdown process is a, is a specific directed antibody so if i have a specific directed antibody which is going to kind of help in recycling my nmdr receptors it's a complicated receptor so when you are talking of nmdr it is especially nr1 subunit antibody which is there so it's a protein the protein needs to be repaired wear and tear ho gaya hai nikal do purana so it needs to be broken down and a new protein will be generated and take its place so something as simple as that so probably all these antibodies auto antibodies are there they don't they are not produced de novo but the thing is they would not 
attack a normal Why? tissue because we have something which is the signaling system in the body doesn't doesn't kind of falsely identify it as a target a normal function tissue but if something is going wrong in this identification system or pattern recognition system then what is going to happen is this set of antibodies which are normally present in all of us which otherwise would function as kind of uh, mechanics will now work over time and start breaking so that is what is the concept of autoimmune this thing we have got something maybe some program in our body which is you know going haywire which is not really identifying tissues which need to be attacked and so everything gets attacked in mass so that is probably the basis of this thing that nothing is generated new it is there the only thing is that they are hyper functioning or they are hyper produced i mean produce more than normal and then that causes a problem so yes we would have them all of us would have it <coughs> but this is something which is an abnormality of function production or whatever because they themselves by themselves are protein so something is going wrong so we have just begun to understand that this is what i what what uh, i have understood after uh, reading because you have an autoimmune dysfunction we have got autoimmune mm -hmm. other disorders also we have got autoimmune diabetes arthritis diabetes. yes diabetes because we have specific antibodies for islets of langerhans in the pancreas okay so lot of it happens and, and and basically our body is in a state of homeostasis so nothing much happens but if there is a metabolic insult or a metabolic imbalance so to say insult matlab imbalance then 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 all these inflammatory processes are hyper working and that is where this trouble can happen that so, was very simplified and lucid boss yeah, thank so you this is this is something yeah. how yes, that he is yeah. he, there to complicate the things master we need to complicate the topic man you are not clear kya complication karna hai the thing is kya mujhe complicated kya karna hai pehle ye bata What should I complicate? Don't don't take Alim seriously. You carry on with autoimmunity. Oh ah, no 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 autoimmunity already actually Malay Bhai has covered very nicely. We we all actually are producing auto antibodies against our body parts <coughs> every day, but there is a tolerance, immune tolerance, which. is there mm -hmm. to prevent our body from getting destroyed now actually any autoimmune reaction is rather mm -hmm. than over production of anything it is it is due to loss of this tolerance if i go into in details the brain's role in autoimmunity is immense the brain actually produces this immune tolerance via the supraspinal suppression pathway the supraspinal suppression pathway which modulates pain so far we knew and now we are starting to understand that it modulates a lot of other sensory reaction it also modulates this immune suppression so auto antibody production is there the suppression of it and the recognition part is getting disturbed in this patient probably supraspinal uh, sensory modulation system has a huge role to play but how much don't ask me i don't know it is too complicated a thing to talk in a seminar and that too for 5 minutes okay so we take up a question now and then mm. we'll again come to it and we'll also there have been some uh, responses to what we just discussed so the mm. question mm. there are the so many slides not visible thing so yeah well whatever is visible the question i'll put it to you okay doctor uh, doctor rajesh jain has asked a question at 8:28 pm so that's about 40 minutes back is pandas an autoimmune encephalitis pandas <coughs> pediatric autoimmune etiology ha whatever it is yes your it thoughts? is an autoimmune process yes 
No, it's an autoimmune encephalitis. So, in 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 relation to what we have uh, talked now, do you think that would uh, fit in the category of disorders? Panthers is actually, I would say, pants. Let, let JJ answer, then we'll come back to your signal. Is pretty actually, bad. Actually, when let him answer, am I uh, audible? <laughs> not yes. audible. Complex There's questions to not me. audible. J JJ come, come. Is basic. JJ to uh, to apna future. Hai. J, bata J, J, JJ general physician. You are neurologist. Now speak. No. GP the thing is. Me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. The thing is, man, lift se utar raha tha kya karu? Ha, abhi batao. Abhi batao. Yes. What about pandas? Pandas is by every criteria. It is a kind of autoimmune encephalitis, but in uh, in contrast to other autoimmune encephalitis, it is directed to a specific part of the brain. That is the only difference. But otherwise, in terms of every other thing, it is an autoimmune encephalitis, not yes. fulminant, not uh, the, a very super acute course. Rather, it is. A slow progressive like LG1 or autoimmune antibody or various other things that fall into that category. Okay. So basically, yes, it, it specifically targets the basal ganglia. So since the yes. higher and cortical, a... higher areas are not involved, you don't get so much of seizure things and sensorium things and hmm. other kind of things. Okay. Second, another question coming to you. This is by Dr. Jaya Jacob. Is hmm. it possible? for the symptoms to continue for long periods with consequences. Yes. In Morvan syndrome, the symptoms continue for decades. W what about your first patient, JJ? If she would have lived, do you think it would have continued for a long time? NT and MDR. I think that was there the first one, no? Right. That was not, not diagnosed. That was the limbic. Yeah. That was not okay. diagnosed. That was okay. diagnosed in a theoretical manner. We could okay. not find anything positive. The that. second one. Yeah. The second one, she joined her college uh, after full recovery. Her treatments, uh, her medications were off. And she mm -hmm. came and she asked, I vividly remember, she came dressed up, uh, this very girl which you saw. And she was wearing a suit and she said, Can I go to college? Can I study? Do you think I'll be able to study? The father said, we, sir, we want to study and get married as well. And to my surprise, she joined. And only once she reported back that everything is going fine. But since she was not on treatment, so I, I presume everything went fine. Yeah. After. But, but, but are these yeah. uh, disorders, uh, yeah, uh, so yeah. long-term uh, prognosis or long-term outcomes? If, if not treated in time, long-term deficits, neurological deficits, cognitive deficits remain. If treated in time, there are patients who recover in a very good manner. Going with the American data, 80%, up to 80% patients recover in a very good manner if treated timely. If diagnosed properly. If diagnosed properly, if treated, the immune suppression is to be done hmm. in the right time. Once we lose that time frame, yeah. then the prognosis yes. worsens. Longer the duration worsens, worsens the prognosis. Okay. Uh, Dr. Heman Belsare asks a question. If the diagnosis is missed and ECT is given, what will happen? What may happen? Diagnosis is missed and ECT is given? Means uh, like you will have catatonia, things, immediate catatonia. Two things all. will happen hmm. if ECT is given in such cases. One is uh, there will be worsening. Okay. So what ECT will do is it might worsen actually. There was an article on it and they actually gave ECT in 31 cases. The patients had worsening of seizure activities instead of seizures coming down. Second was uh, dysautonomia. The bradycardia, the hypotension, it worsened in such, in such cases. Patient had asystole and rather than any showing any improvement. So, and those cases were specifically patients who had catatonia as a symptom alongside and they were selected for ECT which did not show much improvement. Okay. So now see. I would like to add something. Yes. Yes. That yes. is yep. uh, the thing is the actual effect of ECT would depend on type of autoantibodies the patient has because some autoantibodies which specifically affects 
synaptic function their patients of catatonia might temporarily improve the keyword is temporarily temporarily there would be improvement followed by rapid deterioration so i would not say every patient would deteriorate nmda all with deterioration but if we go into other auto antibodies some of them would initially show response followed by rapid deterioration so uh, unless and until you identify unless and until you treat adequately you might get <coughs> odd kind of responses yes ect may not be fatal but i mean post ictal confusion and all those things might be there or as some initial tem uh, temporary improvement and then followed by nothing much happening yes. so yes diagnosis is the key so jagjot you finished your presentation around 852 then you got a lot of good comments excellent presentation well done nice presentation uh worth keeping a very high index of suspicion that is what dr bhushan shukla says okay then the question that comes is uh, what are the antibodies screened in the autoimmune panel that we ask for and how much does it cost <coughs> well the auto antibodies which we have discussed the same anti nmda lg1 ampa gapa and uh, the cost it's a little costly can go from 20000 to 30000 panel there are i think two panels panel 1 and panel 2 uh, srl lalpatla various labs they do it but uh, yeah so it can it can when the report yeah. comes it usually comes negative uh, we had thought of sending the report outside of our state somebody had told in the south that the testing the reliability specificity is higher then we used to send the report but it came late um yes it is a little costlier but it saves the patient okay uh okay so many more uh, congratulatory mm. posts uh, mm. dr philip john yes. mentions that it was a good presentation and he mentions a case where the the patient was treated with steroids and carbamazepine with a good outcome okay thank you sir I think one of the things that you also mentioned and is reflected in a question, but I think you could revisit that. Uh, question asked by Dr. Sunita Ramam: Could sensitization due to COVID also play a role? In play a role in the autoimmune process. Oh, autoimmune process. Yes, it's it's a yes. virus. A tumor could trigger it. A virus could trigger it. And panda streptococcal infection triggers yeah. it. Yes. And sometimes. we don't do anything and it gets triggered yes uh, dr chirak go into genetics and epigenetics but that will be all together a different yeah but but a viral infection can trigger an autoimmune response because it triggers a lot of things one of that yes. being an autoimmune response uh, dr chirak sha mentions that that there are many antibodies which are which we are not able to identify in reports yes because we know some we do not know many auto antibodies to whatever components in the various parts of the brain so yes but an empirical trial with steroids is worth possibly mm. so a good idea uh dr sunaina pande asks you a question if it is diagnosed at at a later stage so months to years you know you have missed the initial diagnosis and let's say it has not been life threatening but there are sequelae something or the other going on whether it's motor disorders or mood symptoms or uh, cognitive impairment okay will giving steroids later on help so that's a trick question i don't have that level of experience okay let me get, let me answer it yeah yeah but let me there, so not to worry <laughs> the thing is there are again i am saying there are probably n number of autoimmune encephalitis syndromes and we know Less than ten percent of it. Everything we know is less than ten percent. Anyways, the thing is, so there are cases I have myself treated, and I have treated in collaboration with various other psychiatrists, where autoimmune encephalitis and various autoimmune reactions were going on for pretty long time. Dr. Kirsi Chawra and I jointly treated a patient from Jagbalpur who had Tifferson syndrome for five years before we managed to treat the patient. So 
our own experience is five years. In literature, there are reports of six years, seven years, even after eight to ten years, there is an improvement in immune uh, therapy and other things. But probably most of the autoimmune syndromes and diseases won't give us that much time. If we are lucky, then we would get a chance in two to six months. Otherwise, there is a high chance of death. Yeah, so mortality is is uh, is going very to kind of, yeah, it's going it's to kind of high. cut short the long uh, time period. Hmm. Um, uh, Doctor Diva is, is something has asked something similar. <coughs> what is the long term course if not treated? Can it relapse? Yes, obvious. If 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 treated, even then it can relapse. You can treat one episode and then later after a couple of years, four years, five years, the patient again. So let's say the first time you gave steroids and the patient became, became a little better. Everything went bad. Four years down the line, she came back or he came back. And this time, florid symptoms. This time it only got better with rituximab, reaching to that level. So yes, it can happen. Okay. Uh, this is... Uh... A long post by Dr. Ashutosh Shah, which has been put up by Dr. Alim. I'll just uh, go through it quickly. Uh, the questions are, what can the public health system do to circumvent inaccessibility to investigations to arrive at diagnosis and start empirical treatment? So one would be the cost, one would be the availability at all points. <coughs> Third is the awareness that at least the group of 140 or so people who attended today's musings when to ask for, what to ask for, make sense out of it. Pros and cons of empirical treatment, I think may be worthwhile if you are suspecting to give a trial of steroids, if not us, if we have a medical, I mean, a physician available or a neurologist available, but definitely yes. Who would treat? Yes, we can treat, but we need to develop, you know, be more confident about diagnosing and using these medications. Uh, Medical legal implications when psychiatrists miss autoimmune encephalitis. Um, no idea. It's going to be a problem because, uh, well, we need to be on our guards when this kind of presentations happen and we should not try and miss it because if we miss it, then, well, we are going to be, or at least if we are not able to write on paper, if you are not able to diagnose, at least write on paper for a neurological opinion. That mm -hmm. might be, uh, and of course, there is always this thing, if I don't understand something, I'll take somebody's second opinion more, uh, uh, as uh, Bhaskar mentioned, that he has treated patients jointly with other psychiatrists. So it, it might be, so overall a good presentation, but later on down the line, uh, he has also given an additional uh, mechanism for autoimmune uh, uh, autoimmune attacks, molecular mimicry and me other mechanisms. So yes, we don't know what our body cells are doing without our knowledge. So um, then we have, uh, I think you have answered this. What is the prognosis in terms of relapse later on and susceptibility to autoimmune response? This is by Dr. Jyoti Shetty. So my, my question is, I would like to tweak this a little bit. Uh, this is for Bhaskar also, that when we have an mm. autoimmune disorder which presents acutely like this, autoimmune encephalitis, mm. Uh, mm. is there a chance that uh, if something like this is kind of managed or goes on, this, mm. let's say the patient is lucky and the first six months are out and this patient has lived on, will this mm. patient be at a, a greater disadvantage to develop uh, some other autoimmune disorders later in life? Yes. Other, uh, other systems, not the. Uh, I mean, uh, of course, uh, here a relapse uh, here and something else somewhere else. Other, the long term course is very, very many patients initially present with autoimmune encephalitis. Later, they develop some other systemic autoimmunity. That is one of my experiences. The other thing, and also literature supports it. The second thing is. Many of them let us present with malignant, and this thing we frequently be. Last week, I lost one of my old patients to cancer, 
because I initially missed the autoimmune encephalitis. I saw I, uh, the 70 year old as a serious case of autoimmune Parkinsonism, which I could not really understand how the autoimmunity was happening. I tried a, a lot of things. I tried treating him, but the response to medication was poor. We could manage to make the per person have a uh, medium level life. But after two years, finally, colonic CA came out. So that is something very, uh, that gave me one wake up call. Bhaskar, is it mainly with cancers or paraneoplastic syndromes where we see these cancer, alternatives? Cancer, cancer induces paraneoplastic. Cancer ah, so induces paraneoplastic. Yeah. So, you know, the paraneoplastic but, syndromes, we see more of them, actually. Yes, but the thing is, you cannot understand whether it is paraneoplastic syndrome or not. Five year or two year down the line, you realize that there is a cancer. And then... On back calculation, you would understand that this was the paraneoplastic syndrome of that. And we lose the patient. I lost that patient yes, just last. <clears throat> okay, so quite a few questions. Uh, we'll take some of them. We may not have time. Do you have about five minutes, Aline? Yes, sir, please. No. Okay. Take care. So that was one. Uh, then we have... Yeah, somebody has, uh, Dr. Imran Ali has asked a question, but I think that you have clarified in your uh, red flag slide. How is the initial sensorium and orientation in, in the initial part? Kindly comment. If altered sensorium and disorientation, it will be the first red flag suggesting organic psychosis. Yes? Do you have any anything anything else to offer here, Dr. Jagjot? Uh, so if I didn't fully understand the question, how is the sensorium and orientation at initial days? <coughs> Kindly comment if altered sensorium or disorientation. So, so sensorium may be may be altered, right? Because if you have something yeah. which is which is affecting cortex, right? Sensorium will be altered and came back. The patient is normal, and then all of a sudden, then is again altered, and mm. the, that is how the behavioral symptoms come. No? Because see, the articles have been written from the perspective of neurologists. They were not able to decipher what behavioral abnormalities. All they could use was the term behavior. So when the sensorial changes, there are changes in the behavior. Okay. Okay. So uh, going There's fluctuation in the orientation. Right. Okay. Um, uh, we will go further on. Um, Any entity zero negative uh, autoimmune. Zero negative autoimmune encephalitis would be a difficult thing to diagnose apart from the clinical presentation. So again, the at the most, what can be done is an, a working diagnosis and maybe an empirical treatment, but it might be a very dicey thing because we do not have a documented uh, kind of thing. So at least one panel definitely will need to advise and then maybe go ahead. Um, okay, the, somebody, somebody, yeah, yeah. I was going to give empirical IVIG in first episode of psychosis as an RCT. Too expensive. Uh, too expensive. No, 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 not no, empirical IVIG. No. If you are at all going to give empirical, go for pulse steroid. Mm -hmm. Once. Steroid. Pulse steroid give you will give you indication. Do not give IVIG at fast based on empirical idea because IVIG is not for empirical ideas. It's that, a that proven, be yeah, yeah it, would, it has to be definite. To uh, uh, we need to be very certain if you are going hmm. to give IVIG or anything else, any other antibody, uh, um, any other immune therapy because uh, they themselves have a lot of side effects associated side effects. So, once so, the so immune need, system is suppressed yeah. all the infections of the world are going to come and get into that patient all, all the infections present in the icu and you will be finding everything positive 
मिराकुलस इट इज you have to see to believe it you yeah. the patient who was gasping mm-hmm. would come back be within the world of living and would start extubation procedure in only 2 to 3 days this is i would not be able to make you believe unless you see this is such a miraculous recovery okay uh, then uh, we have uh, uh should patients suffering with treatment refractory schizophrenia be screened for auto antibodies yes yes but it is going to be very big as dr ashutosh shah has already said yeah, for a research point of view let's yeah. say in yes. some good world the cost comes down and let's say the psychiatrists once want to know why the diseases happen or the disorders happen they should start screening all such patients who are not responding and if the cost factor is low we'll find out okay fine let's no, at, at, given... at, a, at a basic research level you know as a kind of an uh, i don't know an epidemiological uh, um, exercise the prevalence of auto and immune antibodies in years and years of uh, schizophrenia might be worthwhile but okay. may not actually even in first us... episode psychosis that they found around 3% yeah, had but, positive but what does that clinically translate into clinical and and, and again the problem yeah. comes is that when we are looking at schizophrenia what are we looking at because yeah. the similar picture would also come when we are dealing with bipolar chronic bipolars so we need to you know it's going back to the basics of what psychiatric disorders are but uh, maybe yeah. worthwhile an exercise uh i think that brings us to the end of uh, the list I, of i would like to add two lines yes yes there are there are at least six monoclonal antibody trial in various kind of chronic psychosis i don't like to use the term schizophrenia and so far none has given any positive line so already chronic treatment refractory schizophrenia have been put on trials of six different kind of uh, monoclonal antibodies and they have not shown any improvement so from even a practical world point of view schizophrenia patients getting uh, monoclonal antibodies uh, and autoimmune like is not going to help okay so uh i think that brings us to the end of the list of questions uh, and uh, yes uh, i'll hand back the proceedings to dr alim and dr amrit i think ashutosh boss is here he wants to make a comment here. yeah sure please we can move yeah first of all very good presentation jagjot and very good discussion jagjot malaya and baskar uh, thanks a lot uh just one comment to just continue on the thing which uh, dr bhaskar said about losing his patient i remember reading that you know initially the patients may not have any cancer detected when they present with autoimmune encephalitis so the recommendation is to screen annually at least for the first 3 years after the presentation and if possible even up to 7 years because the detection of the cancer can come much later on so just the fact that dr baskar said he lost his patient to colon cancer triggered this thought and i thought i will share it instead of typing it thank you thank you thanks ahul thank you boss thank you boss uh, thank you, to uh, your comments and then we go to uh, yeah. 
thank you very much dr singh for such a lucid succinct presentation thank you sir uh, and which is quite uh, quite important but the question raised by one of our audience about how much we can ask the patient to spend on <coughs> our channel is practicing uh, scope even if in some institutes we cannot ask for that much of investigation the first three which you asked usually middle, most of the middle class people where there is a tinge of organicity even in psychotic uh, psychotic features are done mostly but about the antibody analysis which, which you have to go further and confirm and save the patient how much you can really afford to do it and the legal aspects if we we can be charged legally about also overspend making the patient patient overspend right what we tell tell that it is of a research basis is just to say that patient you are not paying it is being paid that is the difference but how much it can be expanded that is the question and the concern about if we don't do we should not if we are good in record keeping and if we follow standard clinical practices in the country then we are safe. that is the legal mandate if standard medical practices change maybe at that point of time these tests will come down to around 5000 after that thank you very much for your nice presentation it is maybe it was a learning for everyone and your input dr malay dave and dr bhaskar as always the white rabbit thank you very much Thank you. So thank you so much. It was a wonderful topic, very beautifully covered, and I think we had the two best persons as chairpersons, textbooks of psychiatry with us. So thank you so much, Baskar. In the lift, out of the lift, in the clinic, out of the clinic, you are as amazing as everybody else. Malay sir, thank you for guiding and being the pillar, and you know, you you being a very calming influence to the whole whole scenario. Thank you so much. the only the most important red flag to me is abrupt onset illness in a young female or male in a polymorphic presentation not responding immediately you know generally when i have a abrupt case it 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 you know responses are very very fast but once it becomes i think you no know, there is something beyond you know psychiatry or beyond mind as bhaskar vid tell it so then we we look at those things so thank you so much everything has been covered wonderfully we'll have more such sessions good night good night next session we have another interesting speaker which we'll disclose in our next couple of days thank you good night bye good night thank you so much thank you so much